Good morning, church. It's good to be in the house of God today. I get the privilege of sharing the word with us today, and I'm excited. But before I get started, I do want to talk to some of the soul sisters in the house. And if this is your first time, this is the women and the women's ministry here at RLC. And I want to remind you that this coming Saturday, we have soul sisters coffee talks. And so that's at Saturday at 9 a.m. downstairs in the hospital lounge. And what I love about this is that this is a group of women within our church who are gifted leaders and speakers. And so they're being trained up not only to speak and share the word, but also to share their testimony and share their lives and really delve into the Bible and talk about some of the topics and the things that we're going on very individually as women. So I want to invite you to come. It's free. You show up. There is no child care. We ask that only babies under a year come if they can be sitting with you because we really do try to do one hour of just getting together and getting that community and I also want to tell you that on August 9th and 10th we have our soul sisters retreat so if you haven't signed up I encourage you to go to the back talk to either Amanda or Emily or Miss Gifty honestly you talk to anybody any of the women from our church that have gone to this retreat it's really um, last year we went for the first time and we thought oh this is gonna be fun and then we came back completely changed and really unified as a group of women and I'm expecting God to go above and beyond even what we experienced last year so I'll make sure every woman in our house gets invited to be with us on that weekend. So now I'm going to pray because I've had a lot of coffee this morning and we should really invite the Lord. God, thank you so much for your church. Thank you for your people, Lord. God, we ask that you be in this word today, God, that whatever is written on this page has been written by you, Father, and that you take control, that you give us the words that we need for our lives to encourage us to continue to trust you in that journey. So we turn the service over to you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, turn to the neighbor next to you and say, do you trust God? I'm not so sure about that neighbor. Maybe turn to the other neighbor and be like, do you trust God? <laughs> Sometimes we just got to check on each other, you know, just a little reminder. Pastor Anthony, do you trust God? Yeah. Okay, just check in, just check in. <laughs> so we've been going through this sermon series called Trust God. And in Trust God, we really began with Exodus and talk about the Israelites that were in slavery and bondage and how they had to learn to trust God through the seasons that perhaps make us feel like there's no way out, like we're trapped, like there's no one or nothing that sees us. So I'll try to do a brief synopsis so we can take us, because I'm going to take us and continue on this journey that we've been on. But here we see Moses is spoken to by God through a burning bush and tells him to go talk to Pharaoh and say, to let my people go. Out of a series of circumstances and plagues that start hitting the land, eventually Pharaoh lets the people go. Can you trust God to step in on your behalf? Can you trust him? After their escape, the Israelites find themselves taking the long road home instead of the short road or the quicker route, simply because God was saying they're not ready just yet, and they had to trust the longer road. So the question is, can you trust when you have to take the longer road home? Can you trust God? So after their escape, the Israelites find themselves at the edge of the Red Sea. And Pharaoh and his men change their minds, so they start coming after them. So here we have the Israelites standing behind them is the sea. Here comes the enemy. Can you trust God to make a way where there is no way? Can you trust him? So the sea parts. And finally, they get to the other side, the promised land. This is a celebratory thing, right? Maybe you've had a, a long week, maybe you've had a, a long life, <laughs> and you're here today, and you're like, I'm at church, I made it, the promised land, I held on, and I made it here. Can you trust God today, right now, to give you the word that you need for your life for this week? Can you trust him in the moment, not just in this historical events that we get to see, but right now, trusting him to receive that which you're looking for. 
See, the Israelites are free, but soon they start, they start really focusing on their physical discomfort. And they start whining and complaining. After the miracles they've seen, they kind of forget because it's all about them. They were all up in their feelings. It's all about me. And so they start complaining. Nobody does that at this church, right? No? Turn to your neighbor and say, stop whining. Turn to the other one and say, stop whining. Because we have to trust God when life gets uncomfortable, that he will sustain you. So can you trust God when it's uncomfortable? So for 40 years, they walked in the wilderness, it says, the Israelites, because of their wavering faith. Not because God was trying to make that a long time, but because of them. Their faith just started getting weak. Can you trust God when your prayer, your hope, your desire doesn't come to pass in a day, a week, a year, a decade? Can you hold on to the promise that God's giving you for the right timing? Can you trust God? See, a whole new generation is born within these 40 years. And so the Israelites that saw all these miracles happen were now fading away. And so here comes a new generation. And in this new generation, Joshua gets called to really be an apprentice to Moses and to continue with the next generation. Can you trust God when the season changes, when the old things die and the new things start coming to light? Can you trust God for that new life? Even though the old feels comfortable and you know it and I already understand it, can you trust him in the new season? See, the new generation looked towards the Jordan River. And here in this journey, God again finds a way where there is no way. He stops the flow of the Jordan River so they can walk again on dry land. Can we trust God when he brings you? to the other side of a difficult season, even if it doesn't look the way you wanted it to look? Can you trust him and remember the path by taking up your stones of remembrance, which we passed out last, last week. Everybody got a stone. So we can mark the path of a difficult journey and season, not to remember the hardships, but to remember the victory that we now mark. Can you trust God in that season? See, this new generation encounters a fortified city named Jericho. Can we trust God the first time when we know he instructs us when we can see the walls in our lives that we thought would never go down, the walls of perhaps forgiveness, redemption, when they start coming down. Can we trust God when we've been going to celebrate recovery for one week, two weeks, a month, a year? And can we trust him to continue the good work that he's already started in us? Can you trust him through your breakthrough? That's the question. So here we are after a long journey, staying on the other side with a new generation after a long life. And here you are at Redeemed Life Church. See, after a generation came before us and they set up their stones of remembrance, they gave their land, they planted this church, and here we come in, this new generation, which is Redeemed Life Church, and we get the honor of being in this building that someone trusted and planted for us. Can we trust God in this new season that we find ourselves? Do we set up stones of remembrance for others to see. And so here we are, trusting God. After the crossing of the Jordan, we begin to see the Israelites conquer the Canaan land. And so Jericho was the first to fall. And some of us might be in a season right now where we're conquering new lands. Maybe we're taking a new job position. Maybe we just got married. Maybe we just had a baby. Maybe we're going to school. Maybe we're now staying at home for a season. Maybe it's a new territory of just trusting God. 
I think we're all on part of this story. And if we look at Joshua chapter 6, we see here a prostitute named Rahab. She lived in Jericho, and she started to hear what the Israelites were doing. She heard about the power and the God that was behind them and the victories that they were getting. And so here she was, ostracized by society. After all, she is a prostitute, and she's living up against the walls of Jericho because, you know, you get pushed away from society and put aside. And so she lived there, and she went to God. And when the Israelites came and they sent spies, not only did she help them, but she hid them and said, I will help you, but just remember me. Remember me when you come. And so the Israelites come, and they defeat Jericho, and they destroy everything and everyone except Rahab and her family because she turned to God. See, it was severe judgment in this time of the wicked wickedness of the Canaanites because the Canaanites were very intensely into idolatry and into evil practices. And so this, God knew if he allowed anyone to live or any of their, their possessions to go with the Israelites, it was like a cancer that was going to fester amongst his people. And so he wanted to protect his people and their faith. He didn't want them to become contaminated. Can we trust God when he removes things from your life that not everything we think or we want or we look for or the people that we want in our lives are actually good for us and perhaps can contaminate our future? Can you trust God in the redemption story of a woman like Rahab? Can you trust God if your children are far from God and trust him that the story will change for them too? Can you trust God that your brothers and sisters will also have the redemption song in their life? Can you trust God in that season? See, in chapter 7, we see Joshua continues on to conquer land. But one man named Akan from the tribe of Judah that was with him, actually took some of these devoted things, these idolatry items from Jericho and hid them with his stuff. But nobody else knew. And so what happened was this brought sin against the entire people of Israel. So as the Israelites went up against battle to the I, to the Ai people, they found themselves overwhelmed and defeated. They chased the Israelites out from the city gate and struck them down. And it says, at least the people's hearts melted in fear and became like water. Now you have to remember that the Israelites have seen nothing but success in all their battles. So this was very new to them and very confusing. So it says that Joshua and the elders tore off their clothes and sprinkled dust on their heads as a sign of mourning before God. See, in this time, this was an outward showing of sorrow, of great grief, of afflictedness. They were tearing their clothes and sprinkling themselves, humbling besides the Lord, saying, what? What are we missing? They were confused by their defeat because they were trying to live the life that God had commanded for them. Have you ever had a moment like that where you feel like I'm doing everything right, Lord? I'm going to church. I'm tithing. I'm living my life right. I'm trying to witness. But yet somehow you feel defeated or confused. Like there's something you missed. Just something you missed. See, a couple of years ago, I actually um, suffered a severe traumatic back injury. And they sent me to these doctors, and for about a year, I was with these doctors who kept trying to heal me of all these other things. And here we were a year later, I was in so much pain that I probably slept maybe just three times a week, if at all. I was in complete pain. I was on muscle relaxants, anti-inflammatories, everything they could think of. And I just knew one day, I was like, this is wrong. And then I had one doctor say, you need back surgery. And I was like, but for what? They're like, well, it's exploratory back surgery. And I was like, this just doesn't even sound right. If you don't even know what you're actually going to surgically do, you want to explore. I'm only 40 years old. I don't think you'd be quiet. I only 
think that this is something that now you're at the end of your rope. So I asked to switch doctors, and we switched doctors. I eventually found this one doctor that stood back and looked at the whole story holistically. There's so much at this point going on with me because the original problem was unaddressed. I was having now shoulder um, pain. I was having arm pain. I couldn't sleep. I was getting migraines. There were so many things going on that at this point, it's like, where was the root? Well, they took an MRI and found out that I had torn my rotator cuff, which is a very tiny, tiny little muscle that attaches your shoulder to the, to the socket, really. And then there was another muscle that was now also tearing because it was left untreated for so long. See, what happens is that all these back muscles, when a little muscle stops working, the other ones come into alert. And they say, okay, well, we're going to do that job because that, that thing is not doing the job, so we're going to overcompensate and do that job. But when they're doing a job that is not what they're created for, it started getting inflamed and stressed, and that's where all the pain was coming. So aside from that, it was creating nerve damage behind it. So it was all these problems. After I went through a battery of steroid shots to strengthen the muscle and deep massage therapy that would leave me crying until he can get the inflammation to go down and my body to relax, he could get to the actual problem. By the time we got there, he saw that I also my body was in complete out of alignment. That's why I was getting migraines and, and so he needed to adjust me. See, I went through a very difficult season all because it was a little muscle. Just a little, little thing. One small part of my body that I didn't even know existed that was out of alignment. It threw everything off, church. See, the body, church, the body needs to be in alignment. It needs to be in alignment. Now, I'm not saying if your neighbor who is an unbeliever or a friend who's an unbeliever is committing a sin in our eyes of our biblical eyes that we will be judged and out of alignment with that but what i'm saying these people in israel these people that were walking together were very special and they were to watch each other they were to hold each other accountable and so it threw all the people out of alignment see joshua chapter 7 verse 10 says the lord said to joshua stand up what are you doing on your face Again, my translation, why are you crying? Why are you crying? Get up. Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen. They have lied. And they have put them with their own possessions. That is why Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and run. Because they have been made liable for destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. See, we live in this world, but we're not of it. Some of us have walked out of very powerful testimonies. Some very difficult lives. Some very difficult beginnings, let's say. Leaving behind habits, abuse, addictions, careers. Families, friends that were not allowing us to live a life of the true purpose God created us for. But if we're honest, I know if I'm honest, sometimes we allow little things, little, little things, little, little muscles that we don't even know are there to remain, believing they won't hurt. Well, I'm not doing drugs anymore, so I can go out and, and drink. I'm not partying anymore, so I can smoke. Well, marijuana's technically legal now, so cheating on my taxes isn't really a big deal. It doesn't count. They owe it to me anyways. They took it out of my paycheck. Well, I only have one boyfriend, one girlfriend. I love them. We totally know we're going to get married, so we're just totally it's okay. We sleep together. Well, I don't, I don't really do what my friends do, but I do go party with them. But, you know, I don't do everything they do, and it doesn't really affect me. I just go and have a good time. Now, hear me. I'm not saying that we need to remove all unbelievers from our life. We're actually called to witness, and we can't be witnessing just to each other. We actually have to go witness to people who don't know the Lord. And listen, Jesus sat 
with sinners and tax collectors. But Jesus did not party with the sinners, and Jesus did not do his taxes with the tax collectors. So we just have to make sure we get that part of scripture. Because sometimes, I actually have encountered people saying that to me. Well, you know, Jesus, he just loved everyone. Well, yes, but he didn't act like everyone. Because he was set apart, and so are you. So can you trust God with the boundaries that he puts in your life? Can you respect the boundaries that he puts there in protection because he doesn't want you to get contaminated? Because, listen, the enemy knows how to get to you. He knows exactly what's weak in your spirit. And that's exactly where he comes. So can you trust God when he puts a boundary there? Verse 13. Go, consecrate the people. Tell them, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. There are devoted things amongst you, Israel. You cannot stand against your enemies until you remove them. Consecrate yourself. This is something that was done in this time where the Israelites, it was a ritual of purification. Go and cleanse themselves. In a lot of ways, repent. Clean yourself of this sin. Eventually it came out that Akam was the one who took these things, him and his entire family. His kids, the spouses, the grandchildren were all punished. I'll let you read that for yourselves. But in order to bring the people back into alignment, he needed to be removed as well as everyone that belonged with him. And if we go to Joshua 8, it says, Then the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Take the whole army with you and go up and attack Ai. For I have delivered into your hands the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. You shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king, except that you may carry off their plunder and livestock for yourselves. Set an ambush behind the city. Notice here that God allows them to take the plunder, to take all the things, whereas in Jericho, he didn't allow it. See, Jericho was under God's ban because of their idolatry. So all the stuff needed to be destroyed and all the people needed to be destroyed. But not all cities were under this ban because you have to understand the armies are going from land to land conquering these people. This was their form of paycheck, is to sustain themselves, the food, the cattle, the things that they needed to keep and continue on. But it's only where the Lord would tell you that you can take it because you wanted to make sure that you weren't taking the gold that was in a golden statue of idolatry, that you weren't taking things that were going to cause you to stumble. The question here is, can you work at something and not get paid? Can you witness for someone and not see the results? Can you serve at church knowing where our treasures are truly stored? Can you show up for someone when they have nothing to give you or offer you? And it's actually inconvenient, uncomfortable, and ugly. But can you show up for them because God tells you to? See, here we'll see a central theme of faith. Sin. Repentance, forgiveness, move on. Sin, repentance, forgiveness, move on. Because when we're moving on, it strengthens us to build us for the next time. We learn from our mistakes. So we sin, we repent, God forgives. But as Christians, we sometimes get this backwards and we think we sin, he forgives. We sin, he forgives. But we forget to fall on our face And allow God to say, why are you crying? Get up. We think that we can skip a step. But see, in that step, that humbling step of repentance, is where we receive the true blessing and forgiveness. The forgiveness that is freely given to us in that repenting moment. Where we can set our stones of remembrance in order to receive the blessing that God has for us. In Joshua 9, we see Israel attack the southern kings and expand the land, continued. 
when one of the kings from Jerusalem heard everything that was going on with Joshua and the Israelites, he said, okay, I'm going to call the other four kings and all five of us are going to come together and go against Joshua because we'll be more powerful this way. See, he's thinking he's going to come up and he's going to be scared. But, you know, reality, Joshua's like, great, I don't have to, like, go to five different kingdoms. It can all come to me. It's going to be good, right? When our enemies are against us and they unite, it could cause fear. But can you trust God where it says, do not be afraid and trust me? See, the people of Gibeon called Joshua to come and fight and protect them because they see the five kingdoms coming, and they know that now that Joshua is with them and for them. So it says in chapter 10, so Joshua marched up to Gilgal with his entire company, including all the best fighting men. The Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of all of them. I have given them to your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. So Joshua and his men came after and defeated them in Gibeon. The massacre was so great that they started to run away from Joshua and his men. But as they were running away, the Lord saw this, and it says that it began to hail. Not like California hail, but like hail hail where it's like baseballs, and it started hitting people. So as they were running away from Joshua, they were running away from the battle. They were being killed by the hail that the Lord was sending. So here we have Joshua and his men. I'd be like, listen, there has been some times in my life where I'd be like, where is the hail? Because these people up against me, Lord, I need to see some hail right now. And that's real. Don't tell me you haven't imagined it. We've all imagined it. We've all had those thoughts where we're like, all right, you want to come up against me? I am a child of God. I am his favorite. And it's going to be some hail right now. Okay, now you know, you know, you're with me. So can you imagine Joshua and his men killing all these, then seeing the hail kill more, but there was a couple that were still trying to run. Here, Joshua stopped, and he saw them, and he had a choice. Let them run. We already won. These few people that are going to run, oh, well, it doesn't matter. We've obviously defeated them, but not Joshua. In Joshua 10, verse 12, it says, on the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel. So he stopped everyone. His entire army's looking at him. And he says, son, stand still over Gibeon. And you, moon, over the valley of Ahalon. So the sun stood still. And the moon stopped till the nation avenged itself of its enemies. He here, Joshua, knew that this little defeat wasn't enough. He knew that if he let those men run, it was going to fester like the cancer that we talked about in Jericho. He did not run away from the fight. See, the sun was setting, and so these men were going to hide in the darkness. But God brings everything to light. And Joshua said, I do not run from a battle. So as Christians, that's the way we need to be. We need to say, no, 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 I don't run from a battle. Perhaps I'm sober now. But you know what? There was a real issue behind that sobriety that I need to face now. Perhaps I was abused and I acted out sexually for the rest of my life. But you know what? Now that I've, I've dealt with this issue, there's more that I need to discover about myself. Let's get real. Perhaps I'm addicted to pornography. Why are you addicted to pornography? Keep putting the light in the dark places. Do not let the rage take over you. So Joshua said, no, 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 no. Son, stand still because I will win this fight by every single one of them. And as Christians and believers, that is what we're supposed to be doing. Saying we don't go from a fight. We don't run from a fight because we know who fights with us and for us. And so therefore, I can stand and say, son, stand still because I will go through this and find out that I am victorious on the other side. See, we have to take a real inventory, church of what offends God in our lives. Some of us, our sin isn't that big or that stinky. People can't see it. But maybe it's your thought life. What is it 
that offends God. And it's not to condemn us as believers. It's to purify, sanctify, and repent to receive full forgiveness. Why settle for half forgiveness or this surface level Christianity or coming to church and doing church? And No, can we just go deeper because it's about your spiritual life. It's about you and your thought life and your heart. It doesn't matter what other people see, think, or hear. It's what you and your condition is with God. So can you say, son, stand still because I will win this battle. We can't let the darkness hide the secrets, the hurt, the pain, the addictions. Church, that's what's gotten the church in trouble because we don't talk about it. But if we don't talk about it in church where we can love you through things, where are you going to talk about it and receive the love and forgiveness that God has for us? We need to step out and talk about it witnessing to all those that we encounter. We need to trust God through the process and not be afraid. Can we do that, church? Think we can do that? I like to tell people, don't run, Forrest, don't run! Because the world tells you to run. But there's no reason to run. There's no reason to run when you know you're trying to clean your house for the Lord. See, the five kings were found hiding in a cave. So all their men were killed, and these kings, oh, such big heroes are they. They hid in a cave, and the Israelites found them. And so they brought them to Joshua. I'm going to invite the band up. And in verse 24, when, uh, we say, when they had brought these kings to Joshua, he summoned all the men of Israel and said to the army commanders who had come with them, come here. And put your feet on their necks. So here are these five kings laid up on the floor. And he tells the commander, see, not Joshua. He's not trying to point on himself and say, look at me. He's saying the commanders, the people who are on the field fighting the good fight, come and put your foot on their neck. Just get that visual. Put your foot on the enemy in your life. And don't vilify a person, okay? I know there's people that wronged us. I get it. I have had people that have hurt me as a young girl and as a young woman in my life. But don't vilify just the person. Who do you really think belongs at the bottom of your shoe? Think and visualize that. It's a symbol of subjugation. Don't you just love that visual? That visual that whatever's trying to destroy you, you now stand upon and say, you can't have me. Verse 25 says, Joshua said to them, do not be afraid. How many of you did your homework that I gave you last week? I asked you to go and find out how many times does the Bible say, do not be afraid. The Bible says, do not be afraid 145 times. And if we use different variants of do not fear, depending on the translation, depending on, they say there's up to 366 if we really delve into it. Some people say it's one for every day of the year. I don't know. I'll let you do your homework for that. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Be strong and courageous. This is what the Lord will do to all the enemies you are going to fight. If you can hold on to one scripture, church, that's the one. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Be strong and courageous. This is what the Lord will do to all the enemies you are going to fight. Do you get that? You are going to fight. As Christians, we're not promised that easy life, but we are promised that we have a king that is for us and the author of our life. And it says he is going to be there for us. The same God that empowered Joshua who was led out into the promised land, reminding us of our victories, setting our stones and our miracles so we remember. So church, I'm going to ask you, can you trust God with the next chapter in your life? Can you trust God with the next part of your story? Can you trust God with whatever that is that you're holding on to and you think is falling through your hands? 
Can you trust God when you feel like your back is against something and there is no way out? Can you trust God through that medical prognosis because he is your healer? Can you trust God when you feel like you have no more finances and you have bills because he is your provider? Can you trust God when the depression hits because he is our hope and our joy? Can you trust God when you got nothing left? And you're done trying to do it yourself. Because Joshua didn't do anything by himself. He had a whole group of people with him. And he had a God that was for them. And that's who we are, church. That's who we are. And I don't know what you're going through today. And maybe you feel like there is a season in your life right now that you have to really ask yourself, am I trusting God in this season? Am I trusting God and you've come to the point where you're like, I don't know if I have, but I want to make that decision today. I want to make the decision that today is the day that is going to be marked. And I say, son, stand still because I'm trusting God for this victory. And if that's you, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand because together we're all going to pray that we're going to say this next land is ours. And nothing is going to get away. Nothing's going to hide in darkness because we can trust God when we say, son, stand still. So church, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you feel like there's something in your life right now that's been holding you back. But today you say, you know what? I'm going to draw a land right here in the sign. I'm going to say this is the boundary. I'm going to say one, two, three, raise your hand if you feel like today you're going to tr start trusting God for that new victory, that healing. I see you, brother. I see you, sister. I see you, brother. I see you, sister. You're going to trust God. I see you, sister. You're going to trust God for that new land that you're about to conquer because it's yours. It's a promise land and if the promiser tells us that it's ours all we have to do is walk through our victory and say this is ours father god i just thank you for the victories that are going to be fought today lord god i thank you because there is new land that we are going to be taking god i thank you because we can say to the sun stand still and you hold it for us God, we are not confused that we as an earth rotate, but when you control everything, you can make it stand still, Father God. So today, Lord, we ask for those victories in our lives, God. We ask for that hope that we can hold on to that is tangible, Father God. I ask, God, that these stones of remembrance is something we hold in our hands that we can remind ourselves that we have been victorious in the past and that we are going... We are going to be victorious because it says in your word that you are going to fight for us. In Jesus' name. Amen, church. Amen. Thank you for letting me share the word with you today.